Hi, I'm Sandy Banks, a columnist with the Los Angeles Times, and I've written a couple columns recently about animal rescue that unleashed a torrent of comment and controversy about the role of rescues, the role of pet owners, what makes a good pet owner, and how you choose a dog and how you, go, you interact with a rescue. So we've brought some experts in today to talk to you about it, and we hope that you'll participate. You can um, comment to us, at, um, you can tweet us at hashtag AskLATimes, and we'd love to get your comments, and we'll put them to some of the folks we have on the panel today. Um, we have first, we have from a rescue group, we have Jessica Landisman, who is the founder and owner of What's Up Dog LA. Um, she's been rescuing animals for about four years with her group, and she's going to talk about kind of how rescues operate. We are also lucky to have uh, our former um, LA City Animal Shelter or Animal Regulation Department director. Ed Bokes, and he's going to talk about shelters and kind of how you know what you look for. And we have Robert Cabrell, who's an author uh, of and the, the uh, founder and director of Bound Angels. And he's going to talk about um, behavioral issues. He's kind of our behavioral <coughs> expert on how you, um, how you know what kind of dog you need and how you manage the issues that, that some of these animals bring. Um, so I want to go first, um, Ed, and talk to you about about shelters. That ought to be the first place people go when they're looking for pets. We're a city that does not allow pet stores to sell animals anymore. Um, so the shelter ought to be your first place to go. And what do you look for there? And, and what's the benefit to people of looking at shelters? Well, Sandy, you're right. I think that uh, every community in Los Angeles is certainly very fortunate in that it has a fairly comprehensive safety net. Uh, when an animal is lost or relinquished, it comes to LA Animal Services typically. Uh, we have a, a vast array of shelters throughout the community uh, and trained staff uh, to help get those animals placed or rehomed. Uh, unfortunately, time is not on our side and we have to uh, uh, try to get those animals as placed as quickly as possible. And what, the reason we encourage people to come to the shelter is because the animals in a shelter are most at risk of being euthanized. So if we can get them adopted uh, right from the shelter, that frees up the resources of our rescue partners to focus on those animals that are more difficult to place. And that's why they're called rescue. They're rescuing animals from euthanasia. Uh, so if people come to a shelter, talk to the staff or the volunteers there, they know the animals uh, and they can help direct you into finding an animal that's suitable for uh, your, 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 your home and your family and your needs and, and what you're looking for. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time at shelters um, over the years and L.A. has really um, upgraded our shelter system. We have, I know people think it's a horribly sad experience and all. But as you say, there are a lot of volunteers and shelter staff that can talk to you about dogs. There are often areas you can take the dogs and interact with them and play with them. Um, and so it's not the kind of, you know, horrible situation that people may remember. Um, and and it is, it's a place the, the shelter volunteers and employees know how long a dog has, what their issues are. So that's a really good place to start. Um, and that's where that's the rescues typically go. To, um, to, to, to get dogs, as they say, rescue them and rehome them and find owners. And Jessica, tell us a little about how that works. Well, we also talk to the shelter staff and the volunteers about some of the dogs that definitely need out and would perhaps do really well in a rescue. And those are the dogs that we typically take. We take a lot of fearful dogs, some dogs with medical issues. Every dog we can't can't be every dog we take can't be fearful or have medical issues because we wouldn't be able to survive. But um, we spend a lot of time and we re rely on the shelter staff and volunteers to help guide us to rescuing some great fit dogs for the rescue as well. You and then once you get the dog, what do you do? How do you you take the dog out of the shelter and then what happens? We get the dogs fully vetted mm -hmm. at one of our partner vet offices, mm -hmm. and then we move them into a foster home where they can learn how to acclimate to a home environment if needed, if they weren't living perhaps in a home before. A lot of the dogs we take were most likely backyard dogs, mm -hmm. and we help them learn basic household manners, mm -hmm. crate training, how to walk on a leash, how to introduce them to other dogs, and, and these things are what help them get placed into great homes. And that's, that's the, the uh, job that I've done for many years, fostered animals, and it is, it's really rewarding because you, you know, we had dogs that were afraid to go up the stairs, that got scared when they saw themselves mm -hmm. in the mirror. Um, 
you know, one we had a bunch of puppies who'd been tossed out of the back of a truck and were traumatized. And you really do get a chance to kind of get to know them and to prepare them to go off. And that's kind of how rescues are able to stay in business. Most are, are, are all volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, they rely on people to foster the animals for them while they're trying to find homes. They rely on vets to, to help donate services. And they charge when they, when they rehome a dog, if you get a dog from a rescue, and those fees help cover the cost of what they do. Um, and like the animal shelter, the rescues per make sure the dogs are spayed or neutered and microchipped when you get them. So there's not much that you have to do except uh, love them and prepare your home and your family to, to have an, an animal. And, and now, Robert, what does that involve, preparing to take on an animal that, may, that you don't know much about the history and may have had some kind of trauma in the past? Well, most people, when they rescue an animal, if the, if the dog shows any kind of behaviors, let's say what you said, he's afraid to go upstairs or anything like that, the immediate thing that most people do is say, oh, he's been beaten, he's been abused, he's, he has this issue, that issue, and they put a, a, a preposterous amount of, of expectations on the dog mm -hmm. that aren't really there. The best thing to start with an animal is to start completely neutral, to give the animal time, to give it a, a, an area of the house to be, and I always suggest a crate, so that the dog can kind of decompress because the shelter environment is the most stressful environment you can put upon a dog. There's smells, sights, and sounds that the dog's not used to. And if you take the dog right out of that shelter environment, start loving it and wanting to train it and play with it and have like, these expectations on the dog, there's no, 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 no wonder that the animal crushes itself emotionally and ends up oftentimes back in the shelter, ends up biting. So the number one thing is the dog that you rescue or adopt today is not the dog you'll have in three months. Mm -hmm. Behaviorally, you will mold this animal into what it will become. It should become a very strong, confident, independent, and an animal that feels safe with you. And that's my number one goal is for people <laughs> to understand those things. That's really important. Um, a lot of the conversation after my columns about what responsible dog ownership is talked about things like being able to afford the vet bills and making sure your yard is safe and, and those kind of practical things. But what you're talking about is a kind of a philosophical and a really personal relationship with the dog. Um, and I think people, people don't quite understand that. They, um, you know, they're individuals. Dogs and cats are individuals and have their own needs. And so you're kind of saying study that dog and give them some, some space and get to know them, right? Well, you should, and Ed and I have talked about this in the, in the many seminars we've done, it's important to give a dog what the dog needs, not what I think the dog mm -hmm. needs or what you think the dog needs. And love and affection and all those things are really great, but it doesn't make up for the, for the structure that this dog needs and, and the neutrality the dog needs to build so that he can acclimate and build himself into your family structure the way he needs to be. And how long does that process take, do you think? And what should people look for or be, you know, concerned about as it's going on? I always look at it in, in, in scopes from the dogs. So I usually look at a three-month window. Mm -hmm. Three-month window is going to give you a pretty good synopsis of what you're going to have in this dog. And remember, when you first bring the dog home, the children, the neighbors, the family, everybody's going to come over and play with the dog. Everybody's going to give the dog treats and hug mm -hmm. and pet the dog. At the time, the dog is least receptive to that behavior. Yet in three months, when the dog would like that behavior, the whole newness of the dog is worn off and the dog is in the other room and we're talking about a new tricycle or a Harley Davidson for that. Yeah. Um, this needs to be a constant for the dog. The dog needs to come in in a small world, a safe world, just like a child stays in a crib and eventually grows up and then is able to walk around the house supervised. The mm -hmm. exact same thing needs to happen with a dog. When you bring a dog home, it needs structure and it needs focus from us, but we don't need to hover over it and squash its, mm -hmm. its spirit. Thank you. Do you, Jessica, find that people understand this or do you what kind of instruction do you give people that want to to adopt your dogs they definitely it's not something that people innately know mm -hmm. so these are all really great points and very valid points mm -hmm. um, that were just brought up um, that's why crate training is so important for our rescue and it's very true the dog that you rescue does a lot of growing and changing in a few months after and that's what we discover while they're in the foster home so when we adopt them out we really work with the family on their daily routine and what their daily routine should look like with the, the particular dog that they're adopting. Not every dog has the same needs, yeah. you know, but we do say 
don't coddle. You know, we need, the dog needs some time to adjust and acclimate and let us help you. What are you looking for when you go and do the home visits, which a lot of readers complained about, a lot of readers complained about being turned down by rescues and having people coming out, poking around in their house and they didn't like that very much. What are you <laughs> yeah. looking for? Um, well, our home visits are mainly, usually if we get to the point of a home visit, the dog is practically adopted. Mm -hmm. We like the family, we think they're great, we think they're going to provide a loving and, and fun and happy and healthy environment for the dog, which is we couldn't ask for anything more. So the home visit is really to help them understand how the dog can acclimate and really thrive in their home. For example, we adopted out a, a tiny little chihuahua to a family and they have kids. So we went over with the kids how to handle the chihuahua, you know, how we don't want to creep up and scare him. Now this yeah. chihuahua is pretty bomb proof, so I wasn't worried about that. But also his fencing in the backyard, there were some a little a few different spots where he could escape. Mm -hmm. So we suggested they put up some reinforced mesh fencing, which they were happy to do. I, th I would think they'd be grateful, yeah, to yes. hear that. <laughs> Ed, did you have many, um, uh, is it often that dogs adopted from the shelter are returned because they didn't acclimate properly or the people didn't know how to manage them? And, and what can the city departments do about that? Well, here at the Yavapai Humane Society, we have a very low return rate, about 4% of uh, the animals we adopt out of return. But it is usually because uh, the animal did not meet the expectations of the adopter. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Robert said, the animal evolves or grows emotionally uh, uh, after adoption over a period of three to six months. And if the folks aren't giving the animal the kind of attention that it needs in the way of training and socialization and just quality time, uh, yeah, the animal can uh, become less than uh, desirable in the home for those folks. And if those folks, in fact, are not willing to invest that kind of time and energy in the, in the animal, we prefer the animal come back. We would prefer to find uh, a more loving home for that animal. but. It's more ideal if people had an understanding of what they were getting themselves into. Why are they adopting the animal? Are they ready to make a long-term commitment? What does that commitment mean and how is it going to look? Uh, and it's not just them, it's the entire family. It's a family commitment. And I think a lot of people uh, will adopt uh, without really having the time to, to evaluate these questions for themselves and for their family. So what are, for people that are interested, what are some basic questions that people should ask themselves and, and talk about as a family if they're, if they're considering adopting from the shelter or from a rescue group? What, what are the basic things we should ask? Well, like I say, uh, uh, you know, why am I adopting an animal? What is, the, what is the need in our family for this animal? Am I willing to make that commitment? Do I have the time? Uh, how is it going to affect my work schedule uh, and, and the time that the animal is going to need? Uh, and, and, and I think also what pet, which what pet is really right for me? Am I looking for a dog or am I looking for a cat? If I'm looking for a dog, what breed am I looking for? Am I looking for uh, you know, a large dog, a small dog, uh, different breeds? We just had a wonderful animal uh, here at the Yavapai Humane Society that was a victim of, uh, of abuse. Uh, it was a Weimaraner that uh, had an embedded collar because it had been tethered its entire life in a backyard and completely neglected. Mm. And we did an essay contest. We had people writing in from all over the country wanting to uh, convince us that they were the right uh, family uh, for that animal. And uh, essay contests are oftentimes a good way of helping a shelter sort out, especially when you have multiple folks fighting over an animal, you know, who's, who's going to provide the best home. Uh, you know, let them, let them uh, you know, apply in such a way as to really show you what they bring to the table and can do for an animal. Well, the, the idea of the best home intrigues me. A lot of the, re the readers that wrote in to me seem to be focused on whether you can afford a dog and that there are a lot of expenses. And I had some, you know, tally the expenses in ways that would force me to turn in my two dogs. Um, <laughs> but, but how much money do you have to have? And how, like when you answer these questions, and this for you, Robert, too, when you answer those questions of why do I need a dog, you know, um, you know how do you, what are you looking at? How much are they going to cost and how much, you know, they're not orchids. How much, how much care do you have to give and how much do you have to alter your life? Let's look at it this way. First of all, a perfect dog owner is a homeless person. Right. Because a homeless person is always with the dog. They're bonded to the dog. They don't have this emotional 
me to put their dog in a $700 Gucci bag and walk it around Beverly Hills. So I'd rather give a dog to a person like that than some nutcase who's going to do that with the dog. So now, if you look at what it costs me for my dog, it costs me probably over $1,000 a month between what I feed him, the amount of training I do with my dog, his, his toys and his training tools and everything like that. But that's not realistic. Realistically, you, you can, whatever you have, you can invest in a dog. If you have a dollar a month to invest, or if you have a million dollars a month, you, know, you can invest whatever you want. I think the issue we need to look at is what's best for the dog. And that's going to be, yeah, is the person going to care for the dog? Is the person going to, you could live in a $10 million mansion and, uh, and neglect your dog because you're too busy getting your nails done and, and going to parties all night long. So, so that's, I think that's where we need to focus. Yeah, there are costs involved, but there are also amazing organizations that help with food, uh, free or low-cost spay and neuter, free or low-cost uh, veterinary services. LA is filled with things like that. And if, it's, if people need that help, they can go to the LA city shelters. The information is there. The information is online. There's no reason not to have a dog just because you don't have the money for you know, a, an expensive. If, in other words, money doesn't make you a better dog owner. I'm going to yeah. leave it at that. I'm so glad you made that point and that there are resources for people because uh, I had had readers say things like, you know, dog owning is a is a choice, is a privilege kind of, it's a choice, it's not a need and so everybody isn't entitled to do it, which made me pause because it is, for me, it's a need, you know, without my dogs, I, you know, would be a wreck, a wreck. So, yeah. um, so it is a need and it's not something that should be off limits to people, mm -hmm. it just requires some thoughtfulness and, and a commitment. Um, how are we doing as a city in terms of um, providing support for dog owners and educating people, do you think, from what you see out there? I know we have, we, and I always read we have a surplus. When I go to shelters, they are pit bulls and chihuahuas. Um, yeah. That's the, the bulk of the dogs. And, and I, I've heard that we're sending some to other places that will take more. But how are we doing as a city? In managing you know, I, I, if I could speak to that, because I've, I have worked in many communities across the United States, and Los Angeles, when it comes to animal welfare, gets it, I think. Uh, when you look at the shelters that they've recently built, $160 million uh, of facilities uh, for our lost and homeless animals in, our, in, in that community, uh, probably the highest paid staff of any shelter in the world. Uh, uh, you know, I think training could have been, could be, you know, ramped up for a lot of the staff there. But certainly the commitment of the city uh, to our lost and homeless animals and the programs that they have and their commitment to uh, end euthanasia as a way of controlling pet overpopulation. Uh, the fact that we've invested more in spay neuter programs than any community anywhere ever. Uh, and that goes back to 1970. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the commitment is long, it's enduring, and it continues to grow. Uh, more and more rescue groups are popping up all the time, uh, filling niches uh, all across the spectrum. So that probably animals in Los Angeles fare much, much better than any other community. Uh, can Los Angeles do better? You know, there's always room for improvement. But uh, you know, I, you know, having been in Los Angeles for the length of time that I have, uh, there's a lot to be said about the the safety net that has evolved over the years, and the fact that Los Angeles uh, does so well in placing so many animals is probably one of the the highest. Uh, quantity-wise uh, adoption agencies uh, in the United States without question. We have a question uh, from David on Google Plus who said the media seems to portray pit bulls as being mean and dangerous but I got a pit bull from What's Up Dog LA and he's a great <laughs> dog. Did I just get lucky? And you know I, I mean I will say I'm a, a former pit bull owner too and and we were scared of that when I, we first took our dog to the vet. The vet said, oh boy, you made a mistake. This is not something you should have done, but she, but she was a little puppy rescue. And she was, she was not an easy dog um, to manage, but you know, she required more leadership than the others, but was a great and loving and loyal dog. And, and I think that speaks to kind of what Robert was talking about too, was to kind of let them be who they are and find their place. And this dog needed leadership. She needed to know that I was the boss. And you know, I did things with her that would have scared the other dogs. So, um, mm -hmm. so I think it's it's you probably got a great dog, David. I don't know if you know David and his dog. But I think I do. I think he adopted <laughs> Ozzy. It okay. was an amazing pit bull. Oh, I've seen Ozzy on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, you got a great dog. But you also must be a great owner if your dog is is really working out well. 
Um, well, I would, I would tell David that anybody who owns a pit bull is a lucky individual. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I think it kind of it goes back to what are you looking for in a in a, in a pet, and people need to understand pit bulls. Uh, pit bulls are a very unique breed that takes special handling and special care. So uh, while I love them to pieces. I think folks need to really understand the breed and uh, and to be able to, to take care of them properly. Now we had one reader who just weighed in, Lori Danner Asklin, who says, treat your pets like you would treat your children. Set boundaries for them and, and just love them. And I think there's probably some truth to that. Dogs can be uh, a lot easier than children, I think, having both, um, and can pay you back in a lot better ways. But that's <laughs> probably a good starting point, to, to love them. Um, and now the, another question, why doesn't the city enforce the spay-neuter law and why isn't spay-neuter free to all? I think, I think it's a hard thing to enforce unless you're going door to door looking for animals who are not spayed and neutered. Um, and there are rescue groups that are leading the charge with, um, I know Downtown Dog Rescue does, does do free and low cost spay-neuter in, in, in underserved areas and there are a lot of groups that offer that and offer vouchers and also I think that um, you know, I'm not sure when people talk about you know enforcing it, how you do that. It's really it's part of being a responsible owner. And there's a lot of controversy. I'm sure you guys know about when is the best time to spay or neuter your animal, and um, you know, so people may get confused in that. But it should be done, I think, soon and early, having, early having and often. Been, having been one of the authors of the the spay neuter ordinance, it was designed to be a tool for animal control officers. It was not designed to have folks go door to door, Gestapo like, to make sure your animals are spayed or neutered. But if an animal in a community uh, is problematic, is jumping the fence, attacking neighbors, attacking other animals, and that, uh, and the animal is not spayed or neutered, uh, an animal control officer has one more tool in his bag of uh, tricks, if you will, to correct that problem. In addition to setting the animal being uh, at large or being a problem animal, uh, you can also require the animal to be spayed or neutered, which okay. oftentimes addresses the problematic behavior. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's something that's really brilliant right there, what Ed just said. You know, everybody says, well, why doesn't the government enforce the spay neuter thing? You know, in Europe, in Germany, for example, there are no spay neuter laws. So you, you'll have dogs in, in dog sports, they're not fixed. They're not problem behaviors because these owners understand these dogs and they understand what's involved. Their dogs aren't jumping the fence. But Ed's point, I'd like to talk to that he says this gives animal control one more tool. And that's a tool they need. So if a person is an irresponsible dog owner and their dogs are jumping the fence and they are getting out, there is a likelihood that they're going to get other dogs pregnant. We're going to have um, unplanned litters. So that extra tool can be a life saving tool when used properly. Well, thank you. Well, we're, we're going to wrap up. We're about out of time. I hope you all will continue the conversation online. And, um, and I just want to leave with do my own commercial, kind of, um, that, that, you know, rescue groups and the shelter do a good job of educating, um, but in a limited way. And it really is up to, if you are interested in being an, a dog owner or a cat owner and you want to be a good one and you want your, your animal to be healthy and, and safe and manageable, you need to educate yourself some too. There are resources in a lot of places. Uh, I'm going to check out the the, the Bound Angels um, books for tips myself. Um, but also, I want to put a plug in for fostering. You know, these rescue groups are all volunteer. They're doing a difficult job um, with varying degrees of success. They do it because they love animals and and what they need. They need pl people to help them. And you know, fostering has for me been an easy way to love an animal. It's kind of like being a grandma and then let it go and, and feel good because you know that that dog's going to a good home um, and it's, you know, a way to not become like the crazy dog lady with an overrun <laughs> house. So it, it's way easier than you think and if you are interested, you should find a rescue group that, that looks good to you and contact them and, and offer. It's a really wonderful thing to do. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you, um, my experts, for helping. And I hope we have kind of educated people and pushed the conversation forward.